And we're live. Take it away, Mariana. Thank you, Patrick. Hello and welcome. I'm Mariana Islam, and I'm the Director of Programs and Advocacy at the Schott Foundation. We are an education justice fund working to build a movement for equity and opportunity in public education. We're also home to the National Opportunity to Learn Network, comprised of students, parents, and educators, and many of you working to ensure systemic change. I'm so delighted to be our moderator for this discussion, which is focused on protecting the safety, well-being, and opportunity to learn for Black girls. This webinar is the first of a three-part series co-hosted by Schott Foundation and our partners at Communities for Just Schools Fund. Together, we're taking a holistic approach to addressing the problems of school safety and how they interact with larger systems of inequities surrounding race, gender, sexuality, and class. And to help facilitate your engagement, we ask that you please post your questions and comments in the chat box or tweet them out to us with the Schott Twitter handle at shot found and using the hashtag grassroots ed. We will reserve the last 15 minutes to respond to your questions. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today, Dr. Jamelia Blake, Associate Professor at Texas A&M University and Rebecca Epstein, Executive Director of Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality. They're the co-authors of a groundbreaking study which provides first-time da data showing harmful perceptions of Black girls that adults have, um, which provides key insights into uh, discipline and juvenile justice disparities that are often experienced by Black girls. We want to spend the next hour to develop, delve deeper into um, their research. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca to provide additional context about the report. Sorry, Rebecca, you're gonna to have to unmute. I'll learn. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I just wanna thank you and Cassie and the Shop Foundation for giving Jamelia and me the opportunity to present on our report, which we re released last summer. So I wanted to just start by giving a little bit of background about the report before diving into the meat of it, just quickly, so that you know a little bit about who we are and why we're here. Next slide. For those of you um, unfamiliar with our organization, the Center on Poverty and Inequality is on the campus of Georgetown Law. It's part of the law school, though we operate in many ways like a nonprofit organization. And Jamelia partnered with us on this project from her position at Texas A&M, and she was our lead researcher on the report because she's an expert in the field of school discipline, race, and gender. The project was part of the Center on Poverty's special focus on women and girls. And if you go to the next side, slide, um, you'll see that our work was fortunate enough in past years to have generous support from the Obama administration. And this slide shows some of our other partners that we've worked with um, many times as well over the years. The next slide shows the thumbnail sketch of the systems approach that the Center on Poverty takes in our work supporting marginalized girls. And we're proud to announce, if you go to the next slide, that we're taking the Marginalized Girls Project to a new level and we're launching an initiative on gender justice and opportunity that will represent a richer and deeper exploration of our marginalized girls' work. And Jamelia has joined this initiative as a senior fellow alongside two other professors from Occidental and Harvard. Next slide. So now that you have some context for the report, to start off the discussion of Girlhood Interrupted, I wanna clarify the term that we use throughout, which is the term adultification. And that's a term that we use in this report to describe adults' perception of youth as older and less innocent and more adult-like than they really are. And we'll explore this concept more as we go forward. And since releasing this report, we found that the topic has really resonated with people. And of course, make no mistake, this phenomenon is plenty well known already to black women and girls through their direct lived experiences. But there hasn't been a lot of research to provide numbers to support or demonstrate the existence of the problem. So to help get the word out and provide external validation of those experiences, we conducted this research and produced this report. 
And we do need to get the word out because adultification is a form of race and gender bias against children, which feels particularly upsetting because it can function to deprive some of our kids of the childhood they deserve. And that's where the title of this report came from. So I wanna start discussing the research by talking about the reason we decided to conduct it, which is simply the facts that we know about disparities that black girls encounter in our public systems. And for starters, what's clear, what we know, is that black girls are receiving harsher treatment in school than their white counterparts. Next slide, please. According to the US Department of Education, for example, we know that black girls are disciplined in school at far higher rates than their white peers. And this slide shows information at the national level from the 2013-2014 school year from the Office for Civil Rights. And it shows that black girls are five times more likely than white girls to be suspended, and they were about twice as likely to be suspended than, than white boys. And more recent analyses from our partners at the National Black Women's Justice Institute suggest that if anything, things have gotten worse since that year. So statistics like these make the picture pretty clear. And these don't stand alone. They're, these disparities are mirrored in other categories of discipline for black girls as well. And there are alarming disparities because when we see these kinds of patterns, those of you who think like lawyers uh, might say that we're seeing prima facie evidence of bias or discrimination against black girls. So when we look at, um, one second. All right, next slide, please. Just getting ahead of myself. Jamelia, I'm gonna hand it over to you to start discussing um, discipline disparities in more depth. Thanks, Rebecca. So when we think about why are black girls being over-disciplined, it kind of shakes us to the core because it goes against what we know in general about the educational experiences of girls. Girls don't misbehave. Girls sit quietly. They don't get in trouble. But when we look at research that's um, investigated the type of infractions that black girls are being disciplined for, what we see consistently is that black girls are being disciplined for subjective infractions. So these are the types of infractions that are based on individual judgment as opposed to some objective um, category. So um, if you look at this graphic, we see that black girls are twice as likely as white girls to be disciplined for such things as dress code violation, um, not using the cell phone um, or inappropriate use of the cell phone, laudering, things that are very much subjective. Um, we also see that black girls are two and a half times more likely than white girls to be disciplined for disobedience. And this is a study conducted in a single school district in Kentucky, but it mirrors um, the research that I have done myself about black girls looking at a district in Colorado and more broadly um, in the state of Ohio, is that we're seeing that black girls are being disciplined for, for things that are not objective, that require some type of judgment. And when this happens, when people are making discipline decisions about judgment, then that creates the opportunity for bias to set in, that we bring in our own set of values and beliefs in determining whether this behavior is appropriate or not. Next slide, please. So another way to kind of further unpack what's happening with um, discipline and why we think that this, there's this bias underlying this is that what we find when the study from North Carolina is that um, the first time that black students are suspended, they're more likely to be suspended at higher rates than white children for things, again, dress code violations, disruptive behavior, display of affection. All of these are subjective of infractions. So we're not only seeing racial differences in terms of rates of suspensions. We're seeing racial differences in why children are being suspended and also at the first time that they're being suspended. So it's suggesting that Black kids are not even given the benefit of the doubt. Next slide, please. Okay, Rebecca, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Jamelia. So when we look at statistics that reflect the connection between these kinds of disparities in school that Jamelia just outlined, 
and students contact with the juvenile justice system, that's when things really start to feel kind of scary as the stakes get higher. Studies show that schools not only discipline black girls disproportionately, but also push black girls into the juvenile justice system at similarly disproportionate rates in patterns that echo the school suspension rates. Next slide, oh, actually let's stay on this slide for a moment. Uh, this slide is borrowed from the National Women's Law Center. And the three, if you take a look at the three bars on the left, those correspond to black girls. And the three bars on the right represent white girls. So the dark blue bar represents enrollment. So when you compare them, you can see that black girls enrollment on that left-hand side is far less than white girls enrollment represented on the right-hand side in dark blue. And then when you look at who girls refer to law enforcement, which is represented in green, that's nearly equal to white girls, despite black girls representing such a smaller proportion of total er enrollment. And then when you look at the turquoise bar, that represents girls who are arrested in school. And you can see that black girls outpace white girls altogether, again, despite the representing such a minority of enrollment. So there's a clear imbalance there. And I think it's intuitive why this is important. Overdiscipline of black girls reflects bias and fundamental unfairness that we have a duty to resolve on that ground alone. But we should also keep in mind the specific harms that flow from discipline. Suspensions lead to more suspensions and are associated eventually with expulsion or leaving school. And the harms, of course, as I mentioned, are, specific, are especially significant when discipline leads into the just, ju juvenile justice system, starting with arrests in school. And that's arguably more frequent now than ever before, given the increasing numbers of police that are present in our schools and laws that criminalize disrespectful or disruptive behavior. Next slide. And if you take a look at the results of these ACLU studies uh, that took place in Massachusetts and Washington State, you can see that students who are arrested in school are three times more likely to leave school than their peers, and they're four times as likely to leave school if school-based discipline leads to appearances in court. And once students leave school, they're eight times more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. So this, of course, is the school-to-prison pipeline. And if school systems are discriminatory in starting students down that pathway, down that pipeline, given the consequences, I think it's clear that we have a serious problem that must be fixed. Next slide. So I wanna just take a brief moment to leave the school context altogether and look at the juvenile justice system itself, where there too we see black girls receiving harsher treatment. This slide is based on a DOJ analysis of the key points in the juvenile justice system. And in general, as you can see from the top right of the slide, black girls are almost three times more likely to be referred to the juvenile justice system as white girls. Below that, that circle represents that black girls' cases are 20% or 0.8 times less likely to be diverted out of the system than white girls' cases. And finally, on the bottom, we see that black girls are 1.2 times more likely to be detained than white girls. And that big circle on the left shows that black girls are 20% more likely to be formally charged in the system. So given the disparities we know exist in schools that can be linked to juvenile justice contact and the disparities in the juvenile justice system itself, we really need to dig into why black girls are overrepresented in school discipline rates and the juvenile justice system, because that's the only way that we can start to fix this problem, to figure out why it's happening. Just next slide, just to clear off these statistics. There's been relatively little quantitative research conducted to dig into why this differential treatment happens for black girls. So we wanted to see if we could measure one possible root cause, and Jamelia designed the study to do that. So I'll let her take over and talk about the research. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. 
So when we think about, um, when we look at this research and we think about why is this happening? In my own work, um, I've really explored this idea that perhaps that black girls are being suspended at higher rates than other girls because they're violating white middle-class gender norms. They're not behaving or acting in the way of the standards of, of femininity of how girls should behave, which is dictated by white class gender norms. Next slide, please. And as you'll see in the next slide, what could be happening is that the stereotypes that we have for black women are actually trickling down to black girls. And that was really my thinking in trying to explore whether or not adultification was really happening. Because again, what we know broadly is that black girls are, um, you know, ex exceeding high educational attainment. We, we do have successful careers. So what's happening that they're being diverted in the school system with over suspension? Well, there are three prominent stereotypes that have been depicted in the media and historically captured black women. And that is the stereotype about the mammy where black women are seen as being very self-sacrificing. They're seen as being a caretaker. Um, they're seen as being very nurturing. And although that stereotype is very prominent and we do see that continually depicted, you know, throughout history and in other research, that's not one of the stereotypes that I personally believe is influencing um, the perception of black girls. The second stereotype is the Jezebel. And this is the stereotype of black women being very um, uh, hypersexual, being very promiscuous, um, being very flamboyant. And this is one of the stereotypes that might be guiding the reason that black girls are disciplined, over disciplined. And then the final stereotype is that of the sapphire. And this is the assertive um, perception of black women and black girls as being very aggressive. And it is, we suspect, or what I suspect is it's that these two stereotypes as Jezebel and Sapphire are being mapped onto the behavior of black girls. Um, and when they do map those behaviors unconsciously, these stereotypes, then black girls' behavior is seen as volitional, as something that they've controlling, something that needs to be corrected, something that's intentional to harm. And so there is this use of suspension, discipline to control and manage these behaviors, even though these are based on stereotypes and black girls may not actually be engaging in these behaviors, or that might not be the reason for these behaviors. Next slide, please. And so the idea that these stereotypes might be trickling down to black girls suggests that perhaps black girls are not actually seen as children. They're not given the benefit of the doubt. Their indiscretions, their, their behavior is not seen as mistakes as typical of adolescents, but instead they're being seen as adults, as black women. And there was a study conducted by Philip Goff and his research team in 2014 that actually looked at how black boys were perceived both by adults in general and also law enforcement. And what he found, which was particularly compelling and sad at the same time, was that black boys were perceived as less innocent than other children. And he argued that this, the adults tendency to dehumanize um, black youth contribute, particularly black boys, contribute to the perception of them as being more culpable for crime. So this was influencing law enforcement to see them as adults, to see them as engaging in crimes, even if they weren't doing that. This was the bias that they held. So using this study as kind of a background, what we noticed is that Black girls were glaringly missing from both the sample and the analyses. And so we were interested in seeing if if this perception of innocence or lack there of innocence that, that Goff found for Black boys also extended to Black girls. Next slide, please. So to do this, um, we designed a study. Um, well, I designed a study that um, surveyed adults in the community. And the sample was 325 adults. It was predominantly white and female. And what we did is we um, constructed a survey that was based on the perception of children as being innocent and also based on some of the stereotypes that we know are held about Black women. And so we asked respondents to 
um, they were given an opportunity to either look at a, a survey about black girls experiences or white girls experiences and we randomly assigned them to one of the surveys and the questions asked these the participants to rate the extent to which they perceive girls at different ages black girls and white girls so we see from ages zero to four five to nine ten to fourteen fifteen to nineteen as are they um less innocent do these girls need nurturing do these girls need protection are these girls knowledgeable about sex more so um than other girls um and what we found the results were um incredibly uh, uh eye-opening so um when when I designed this research, I went into it the hypothesis thinking, okay, so there might be racial differences in the perception of adultification for black girls age 10 to 14 or age 15 to 19, because that's the age that we're starting to get into late elementary, middle school, high school. So we would expect there would be maybe some racial differences given the findings. But what we found that as early as age five, black girls were seen as not needing nurturing. They were not being seen as innocent. They were seen as being knowledgeable about adult topics. And you wouldn't expect a five-year-old to know that. So if you look at this graph, um, the white line represents um, the ratings of white girls. And think about this as a magnitude, right? The size of the difference. The blue line represents the ratings of black girls at each age group. So if you look at age group one, you see that there's very small difference. Um, and how um, the respondents rated infants or children in early childhood. And that's what we expect. We wouldn't expect young babies or infants or preschoolers to know any difference. When you get to age five to nine, that's where we're starting to enter into kindergarten. That's where we're starting to enter in elementary school. And we see that there are huge racial differences that black girls at age five, as young as age five, are perceived by adults as being less innocent. We see that this increases as black girls approach adolescence at age 10 or, or early adolescence and into adolescence at age 10 to 14. And although the perception of black girls um, in high school goes down, it's still higher than white girls. Next slide. So, and you can just click these each. So to give you a little bit more idea, you can go to the next bullet, thank you, you can click them all. To give you a little bit more idea about the type of questions we ask so you can understand the magnitude of the difference, right? So this is just a selection of the nine questions we asked uh, the participants. We asked them, how much do black or white females seem older than their age? How much do black or white females need to be supported? How much do black or white females need to be comforted? Again, how knowledgeable are our black or white females about sex? And how independent are black and white females? Um, and how often do black white females take on adult responsibilities? And so in asking these questions, again, what we wanted to tap into are black girls seen to the same extent as white girls as being children? Are they afforded the opportunity? Or are they seen as adults? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, Rebecca. So it, it makes intuitive sense, right, that adults who view certain children as less innocent could be more likely to treat those children more harshly. And that's the critical implication of our study, echoing Professor Goff's for boys. So I'll take a moment to look at, again, at the juvenile justice system as an example of how that connection can play out for black girls. That is the connection between perceiving children to lack innocence and treating them more punitively. The juvenile justice system, of course, was designed for kids. And if we look at some of the principles that it was built on, it can help us understand how adultification might come into play. Next slide. So one of the principles um, on which the juvenile justice system was built was that we need a separate system for kids because children shouldn't be held as responsible for their actions as adults. And a second key tenet is that children are likely to benefit from rehabilitation. So in other words, they can change the course of their lives if given a second chance. So harsh punitive treatment is less appropriate for children. And the Supreme Court has recognized these principles in many cases. Next slide. 
I selected one case that's relatively recent from 2005 in which the court relied on scientific and sociological research to recognize that children aren't as responsible for their actions because they're immature. They also recognize that children are more vulnerable to external negative influences, so they shouldn't be held as responsible for their misbehavior. And similarly, children are still struggling to define themselves. So when they break the law or misbehave, it doesn't really reflect who they are fundamentally. It doesn't go to what the court called an irretrievably depraved character. These ideas about children are what the juvenile justice system was intended to recognize in many ways. But the problem in carrying out that philosophy in practice is that judges, of course, retain immense discretion in carrying out their duties, as do all other actors at various decision-making points in the along the juvenile justice process, probation officers, police officers, prosecuting attorneys, and even defense attorneys, too. Next slide. So what happens when a judge or one of these other actors in the system is looking at the girl but sees someone older, someone who's maybe not so innocent, someone who doesn't fit the model of the ideal child whom the juvenile justice system was designed to protect and guide. So in other words, what happens when an authority figure perceives the child before them as mature? You know, she knew exactly what she was doing kind of thing. Someone who is effectively more like an adult who should be held responsible for their misbehavior. And that's where adultification bias, again, can come into play. And given that our study indicates that adults do tend to view black girls as more adult-like and less innocent, judges may feel that a harsher punishment is more appropriate for that child, as might other key decision makers in the system who can harbor implicit biases that influence them and similar, similarly contribute to harsher results for black girls if they're viewed as older and more adult-like. And we would argue that school systems stand in a very analogous place to the juvenile justice system when they determine disciplinary decisions. Educators and police in schools might impose harsher treatment to girls whom they view as maybe not deserving as much leniency as other girls and are essentially more culpable for their behavior. So we need to think more about what goes into such determinations that carry such huge implications for children. And that's what this report really asks of the audience. Next slide. We, we view the report really as a call to action. First, we hope that a dialogue that began when we released this report back in June can continue about adults perceptions of black girls as less innocent. We also think second that more research uh, is called for. We hope that other researchers might engage in deeper dives, including examining other girls of color and stereotypes that might influence uh, penalties levied on them. And finally, we view the report as a call for reform. Our public systems should pick up where we left off and start working toward learning more and counteracting this form of potential bias by developing trainings and educating and informing people with authority over black girls about adultification. Next slide, please. Uh, we're encouraged that the conversation uh, seems to have begun and is continuing today. The, this slide gives you a smattering of, of media outlets that publish stories based on the report and, and picking up on the thread of that, um, of the theme that we started. And the conversation is, is still continuing these, these many months later. So I think um, that actually is gonna conclude the formal side of our presentation and we're, we're happy to open it up to questions. Uh, and if you'd like, feel free to use uh, the contact information um, if you have any follow-up questions. Mariana, I guess I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you as I un tried to unmute my line. <laughs> um, so a few questions have come in through chat and so I wanna get to those. 
Um, so the first question is related to policy. And so I'll direct that to you, Rebecca. Um, so there are folks um, who are tuned in, who are heads of uh, public school districts. And uh, we also have folks participating from PTAs, um, from labor unions and other advocacy focus groups. This particular question is about accountability measures that districts are thinking of um, and also states um, around implementation, uh, um, understanding what can be implemented um, to address the disparities um, in, dis in discipline rates for black and brown girls. That's an excellent question and accountability is so important in, in bringing change to systems. If the question is about this research in particular, we want to be careful about what we believe um, can be justified based on the evidence that we've produced so far. It certainly seems to be the case that we need more training across the board on gender and race bias, particularly as they combine for girls of color. Since we do see discipline and other punitive uh, penalties levied against girls of color across the board. I want to I want to say more because there in, in every uh, system that we have studied, and this is not the only form of bias that that we have looked into at the Center on Poverty, and that's certainly true of Jamelia as well. We do see a dearth of of training for educators for police and schools that's that's designed to give culturally competent trauma-informed and gender responsive solutions to people who are working with girls. And those are the kinds of trainings that we need to get at this and really any other form of bias that we may not realize is there, but that's influencing this harsher treatment against black girls. But Jamelia, if you have anything to add, I'd certainly be interested in, in whether you have anything um, to add to my comments. Thank you, Rebecca. I think at the most basic level is, um, disaggregating the data and looking at the intersection of gender, race, and um, also uh, socioeconomic status, right? So in terms of these accountability measures, really starting first and looking at your data and where you are. Um, and for individuals who are in different systems, really working on data integration and connecting data from systems. So tracking how children are moving across different systems. Um, and then, when you have the data, and I think school districts in particular are starting to do this, when you've started to disaggregate the data just in terms of numbers, then the next step is to convene a committee and let's start looking at the referrals, right? So let's, let's, let's start looking at why are these girls of color, black and brown girls, getting more suspension? What was the reason for the referrals? How many, how many referrals, and when I say referrals, I mean office discipline referrals, those usually precede suspension. How many referrals did they get and what type of referrals are they getting? And then go down another level and start to um, randomly pull case files and start looking at the wording and the description in the original referrals because that's going to help you whittle down to the root causes and help you start to um, tailor the kind of training that your staff needs in terms of responding to this and preventing this from happening. So a lot of times, I think in terms of accountability, we take this bird's eye um, view, which is a good start. But if we're really going to get down to the heart of the matter, then we have to whittle down and, and going to each level to really understand the nature of the problem. And the districts that I have had contact with who started to do this have had very eye-opening um, embarrassing, unfortunately, experiences where they realize I didn't know this was happening, right? And I realize now that we need to train our staff in these specific areas because schools are, um, and, and broader agencies, I would argue too, are doing cultural competency training, but it tends to be very broad and generalized and it really is not content or culturally um, specific or gender responsive as Rebecca had mentioned. So those are kind of my recommendations in moving forward. But, um, but that's not a one-time process if we're thinking about accountability, that's a routine process. And so you need to build in the capacity and the resources for your organization to do that continuously. And I would just add to that on the other end of things, 
if to hold decision makers truly accountable, you need not only to collect the data and understand what's going on, but make sure that there's change that's responsive to the discriminatory patterns that emerge as a result of collecting that data. Great, let's go to another question. Um, and this one is uh, related, it's a specific research question. So for you, Jamilia, um, and it's around, um, you know, to what extent um, did you consider in your research a language acquisition um, and dialect for zero to four in terms of um, informing sort of adults' perceptions for um, children in that age group? Mm -hmm. um, am I off mute? Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. So um, to clarify, um, we adults weren't looking at any information in terms of language acquisition. What we expected is that there wouldn't be racial differences between zero to four. What they were doing is they were presented with a series of questions and saying for children, for girls ages zero to four, black girls, are black girls age zero to four less innocent? Do black girls need more support? So whereas language acquisition um, would be important if we were doing um, more of an experimental study, if we were presenting babies and, and little kids in front of adults and then asking them to rate them because they're actually observing them, I think that actually would be really cool and very important. But in this way, the respondents didn't have any other context all they had was their question. So that made us um, feel even more confident that this is their bias, that they're naturally, this is what's naturally coming to my head in the absence of additional information, like how much does this child talk? What kind of words are they using? How are they playing? What are they dressed like? What do they look like, right? When I, whenever I look at the PowerPoint presentation, I'm so moved by the pictures of the young girls, right? And all of those things can influence my ratings of how I would respond. But our survey participants didn't have any of that information. They just specifically had survey questions, which um, makes me think and feel confident that this is a bias. This is something that they have, they assume about black girls. But thank you, that's a good question. It'd be a good study if there's any graduate students on here to do in the future. That's what I like to do, think of ideas for other people. I think it's worth, sitting with that for just a moment and thinking about how overt, um, how close to the surface, I should say, this bias is. When you think about those questions that Jamelia put up in her slides, they were not subtle. They were not trying to get under the surface to dig out something extremely uh, hard to get to. This was outright asking, do black girls need protection? And when Jamelia first showed me this measurement tool before we distributed it, I said, aren't you being a little obvious? Who's gonna say, no, black girls don't need protection. Black girls don't need nurturing. I mean, it just seems like people know enough to say things even if they don't actually feel it to cover up their biases. And Jamelia knew better and said, let's just let's see what we get. And in fact, um, without again, without any other signifiers without any other signals from the environment. We did see those discrepancies. And again, what we were most shocked by was that they started showing up as early as age five and in fact were um, at their greatest um, in, at, at such an early age range. We were expecting, I think, Jamelia, correct me if I'm wrong, we were really thinking about looking at adolescence, I think as you said, um, with the onset of puberty, et cetera. So it was pretty shocking. Yeah, we really thought that these racial differences were going to emerge in adolescence. So to see them at such a young age, you know, it's disheartening. But yeah, it was it was a surprising finding. Thank you. I, I just want to remind folks that we have a bit of time. And so if you have questions, um, now would be the time to tweet them to us using uh, grassroots ed hashtag as well as um, put them into our chat box. Uh, so this next question is really about, um, so we've gotten some questions um, ar around law enforcement. And I know that we're gonna have a webinar that's part of our third part of our webinar, uh, I'm sorry, second part of our webinar series that will focus on um, school resource officers. Um, but can you talk about 
Um, so what this research does and doesn't do, because I think that's a really important part of um, answering some of the questions that we've gotten in, specifically around sort of the structural racism that's embedded in our, in our systems, right? Uh, and so if you could speak a little bit to that, that would be really helpful for our audience. Um, so what I think this research does do is it just shines a light on, again, as Rebecca started this, you know, as a Black woman, this is my lived experience. This is what I've gone through. But oftentimes my narrative is not sufficient. So it shines a light on what we know is happening. It makes it harder for us to ignore structural racism, right? It makes us harder, I mean, it makes, us, it, makes it more difficult for us to say, well, this is just about behavior. You know, this is just about SES. It's very clear that this is about race and structural racism. I can't really speak to the point about the school resource officers. Um, that's not my area of expertise. I'll let Rebecca speak more about that. But I think what this report does do is say, look, we have evidence. We have the beginning evidence to suggest we know that Black girls are being oversuspended. We've hypothesized, we've suspected why this is happening. We got one possible root cause. Now, this is a beginning step. So we need to replicate the study. We need to extend it. We need additional evidence because you can't, you know, that's what research is, it's the accumulation of evidence. So we need more research to kind of support this. But it's one step to say that this is not in people's heads, that this is actually happening. And this is why black girls are, might be over disciplined, right? And once you know why something is happening, you can start to address it. You can start to correct it. You can start to remediate it. And so when we talk about structural racism, we need to be talking about rethinking the systems, right? And there are definitely, that's definitely a policy way to do that. And we should still, we should still work on that. But we can also think about local policies, right? In terms of how we start to change, um, how we start to train and prepare individuals to respond to black girls so that they are not just systematically pushed out of the classroom. So I think the research kind of sets the foundation for why we have this happening, what are the root causes, but it doesn't tell you what the solutions are. I think that's where the next step of the research, the next step of partnering with practitioners, policymakers, that's, that's the next step. But I'll let Rebecca speak to the school officer uh, question, which I think is good. I appreciate uh, the thought behind the question about school resource officers now that there are so many in schools and not only are we finding that they're enforcing criminal law, but they're also, their roles are being bled into the area of discipline. So um, often we have found in, in our research with Monique Morris, police are telling us that educators are calling them in to deal with discipline issues, even if the police themselves see their role properly as enforcing criminal law. So as Jamelia said, this is another piece in the puzzle, and police are an important one because they are the conduit between schools and contact with the juvenile justice system, which can produce such harms for girls. And when we were conducting our research in the South about school resource officers, we found a dearth of any training about any issues that would be considered to be specific to girls of color. And in fact, the officers that we talked to were very candid in saying that they wanted that training. They want more tools in their tool belt. But it's not just about training. It's also about the tools in their toolkit to interact with girls of color once we start recognizing uh, biases and starting to broaden our responses to girls. So we, we need to know more about community resources. We need to gather more data. We need systems working together to respond to girls of color more appropriately and not treating them essentially as an adult. Wonderful, and so this next um, question and, and ask and you shall receive, right? So we have questions pouring in, um, particularly about, um, you know, for educators. Um, so um, have you partnered with others addressing implicit bias in um, the teaching force? And might unions be open to this message and to this work? 
Okay, sorry, the muting and unmuting is throwing me off. Uh, that's a yes, that's like the next phase. And so I'm always interested in partnering um, with school districts to um, work on how we address implicit or explicit bias um, in this work. Um, that's the beginning phase. So if you're a school district and you want to partner on this and you want to partner on developing training materials, definitely send me an email. Um, because I think the interest on my side is there. It's whether or not districts are willing to extend themselves to really do a collaboration and really look into this. Um, because it does feel uncomfortable, but it's it, these difficult conversations, these, these we have to go through this. If we're gonna have behavioral change, if we're gonna change the way the educators are interacting with children and vice versa, we have to go through this process. So that's the next logical step. And I'm definitely always looking for partners. So I really appreciate that question. Okay, Rebecca, I wasn't sure if you had anything to, to add to that. Nope, I think that takes care of it. Jamelia and I are looking to um, forward to partnering on further stages of this same research. And in doing so, we do wanna work with schools. So um, a call out to them to get in touch with us is exactly the message that I would have imparted as well. Great, and there are a number of uh, advocates and organizers, as I mentioned, who are um, participating on this webinar. And so are there any um, ideas for them on how they can use this report to talk to policymakers and to others um, in, in their district? Well, if, if I would take the first um, pass at, at responding to that question, advocates, advocates are such a critical tool in bringing about the kind of change that we need. And what we really need, advocates are typically the ones who are working directly with girls. And we need to bring their voices into the conversation. And if, if we can wed those two things, the voices of girls talking about their experiences and making suggestions about uh, what they think needs to happen, and our research, which is providing some evidence to support the experiences that they are talking about, that together can really, I think, help produce a very powerful narrative that can be persuasive to policymakers. Jamelia, do you have things to add? No, I agree. I agree. I think a youth voice, the, the voices of girls need to be centered in the advocacy work. So I, I, I completely agree. Thanks. So my next question is, um, we have a question and it might be from a parent and one that I'm actually interested in as a, a parent of a black girl is um, what can be done at home to address this issue? This, this is a tough question. I've gotten this a few different times and I, I want to be very transparent in saying that I don't know if I have a direct answer, but I, but I think, um, so there's, there's a lot of work on racial ethnic socialization, right? And what parents need to be teaching their children um, about their race and ethnicity to kind of foster positive racial ethnic identity. And so, and I'm a parent of two beautiful black young girls who are now becoming young women. And so this is something that I struggle with too. So I don't wanna contradict what the literature says. So let me start off with what the literature says. So um, Explicit racial ethnic socialization, if you do that in the form of reinforcing kind of negative stereotypes or bias, then you don't, you set your child up for the potential to not have a positive sense of ethnic identity. It doesn't go positively. However, um, when it's developmentally appropriate having these conversations. So what I would argue is to center the conversation about the history of um, black and African American people in this country, right? And and as your kids start to bring up questions, to start talking about um, rooted in history, what has happened. So not a particular incident, but that may start the conversation. But what has happened historically? How do they feel about that? Why might this happen? So I, I've had some conversations with um, young black girls, um, just even about appearance, right? And why, you know our hair and the way black girls' bodies are views and black, black women's bodies. So starting to have those conversations with them. And then if the concept of adultification comes up, 
then to begin to have that conversation, but I would not introduce it. So what's happening in my home, because I do this work, right? And so, um, and, and my children are a little bit atypical. Um, we talk about this a lot, but we don't talk about the concept of adultification specifically. We talk about the, our history. We talk about the history of, of, the, of the diaspora, how, how Black people got to this country. We talk about slavery. We talk about the stereotypes that, ha that occur and, and how they experience this and what does this look like, right? And I make sure I center this not in people are out to get you, but if these things are happening, this might be one reason. And I and I but my children are adolescents. They're at an age where developmentally they have the cognitive sophistication to engage in that conversation with me. They have the perspective taking. I didn't have this conversation with them um, when they were four, right? So my children are 12 and 15. So we're having this conversation now because they're starting to develop their ethnic and racial identity. They're starting to notice things. They're starting to see differences. They're paying attention to the news and they're seeing all these things. And one thing I wanna say as a parent, from parent to parent, it's a different world than what we live in. My children are much more informed about the news because they're constantly on social media. They're not on Twitter and they want me to get off Twitter because apparently that's a bad thing. But they're on, Instagram and YouTube, and they are getting exposed to um, actual news, but they're also getting exposed to a lot of opinions through the comments. So they're getting a lot more exposure than I even got as a young person, not just about issues of race, just about issues of everything. So these things are on their mind. So you have to begin to start thinking about that dialogue because I, had, I hadn't thought about that. And my girls told me, oh, mom, we had already read your report. And I'm like, really? You read the report? Because they're following these things. They're seeing trends. They're seeing people talking about this. So I would say start by tapping into what they know, what are their questions, and then give them the appropriate background. But I wouldn't automatically jump to bias until they're ready to start having that conversation. And I would think about if they're developmentally ready. Are they mature enough do they have the perspective taking skills? And if you are in a position where you're ready to have this conversation, but you just don't know if your child is ready um, to just do a plug, find a psychologist or a social worker who specializes in, you know, speaking and talking to culturally diverse youth and, and ask them to gauge that and ask them, how might you set up this conversation? Because we, because as parents, sometimes we think we're doing good and sometimes we're not, but we have to have these conversations when kids are at a developmental level that they can understand it. Does that help? Yes, that absolutely helps. I feel like there needs to be a whole book on the talk in a different way, right? Um, <laughs> uh, speaking of which, um, we also have funders um, on this call. And so we want to know a little bit more about what is the message to philanthropy? Because it seems like there needs to be more work in this um, area. Um, there seems to be, you know, in this chat, a call, especially around this work um, to address discipline disparities, but also the big movement around culturally responsive curriculum, right? Um, and having um, implicit bias uh, trainings and other, um, training and support for educators. And so there seems to be a whole field that needs to be built around this specific conversation that we're having right now. So what is the, the um, you know, opportunities for philanthropy in this work? I would say that the message to philanthropy is to get involved and take responsibility. Uh, this, this work is funded by the Novo Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. The Center on Poverty is funded strictly by philanthropies like those. And the Novo Foundation in particular has really taken the lead on centering the importance of girls of color, first by engaging in listening sessions with girls of color themselves, and then making an explicit priority for their grant making for girls of color and some other uh, philanthropies have followed suit, but we need a lot more, especially in light of political differences now than a few years ago. We are finding ourselves in a shrinking field of support and we need philanthropists to get out in front and really take the lead. Pamela Schiffman of the Novo Foundation actually recently released a really interesting article about the role of philanthropy in this work and I, 
certainly urge all grant makers to read it. So I would just add to that, um, that um, this is a really sexy topic, but it's it's something that has been going on for more than three decades. Black girls have been over-disciplined for more than three decades. We're just now um, disaggregating the data and looking at this. And so I think we have a tendency in our society to go after what's flashy and new. And what I want to call on funders is to stay the course, to really stick with this long term funding both kind of what I call the basic science, why is this happening, as well as the re proposed remedies and solutions, right? Because oftentimes we we abandon things in the middle of them because we're on to the new topic. And to me, this has been my life work, you know, advocating and researching for Black girls. And I'm so glad we're getting an opportunity, a platform to shine. I just, I just don't want us to lose that platform. Um, and I want us, I want the commitment to be long term and us to think about um, we want to work on the remedies. We need the remedies, but a lot of the remedies can't move forward and we won't know if they work if we don't understand the science behind it, the why, the how it works. Um, so that would be my personal um, call to funders. Grant Makers for Girls of Color uh, is an organization that interested uh, philanthropies should should look into if they're interested in pursuing this. And I wouldn't overemphasize um, how much girls have broken through, even in this brief moment when girls have taken center stage, which I have seen slipping away actually in recent years, girls have remained invisible in the national conversation and in most research for a long time. So we've never really had that moment um, that we that's still to come. Thank you for that. Jamilia, I'm going to um, give you the final question, um, which is, you know, because I, I think there are folks who are also going to be watching who are really just interested in research, right? Um, and, and what does it mean, too, to be a Black woman leading this research on Black girls? Wow, what an amazing question. Well, what I want to say is I'm not alone. And there are a number of Black women who are doing uh, phenomenal research on Black girls. I just got lucky <laughs> and, and, and developed some partnerships. But, um, you know, um, I don't want to get emotional. But, you know, when I started my doctorate, this was always something I wanted to do. I always wanted to have a focus on Black girls. And so to see your passion um, realized, to see things that you have been calling for coming to fruition, to have people come up and tell me like, thank you for doing this work. You know, this really captures my experiences. It means so much to me. You know, it really uh, fuels me to continue to do this work, to not give up course, even though we have shrinking budgets, even though it may not continue to be in vogue, right? It, it will fuel me to continue to do this work and it inspires me. Um, and I'm pleased that that I meet young scholars, young students who say, man, you did that study and that's exactly what I want to do. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's great to know that this next generation is going to take the baton because that's how this works, right? As, as you climb, you pull someone up, else up and you inspire them to do this work. So I'm excited. I'm not alone. There are other Black scholars, uh, uh, women of color who don't get the props and the accolades that they need who are doing this work, maybe not directly related to discipline, maybe related to STEM, maybe related to educational opportunity and access, but, but we're all doing this work. And so what I would ask um, the people listening is to look for that work, to cite Black women, to look at these scholars who are doing this, if you're on Twitter, to see who we're all following, because we're a community and we're all, we all have the same goal, but it, it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting time. I just want us to stay the course and to not allow the, the work that we have done on Black girls to be overshadowed um, for us to have that continued commitment. Thank you. That was a great question. Absolutely. And so I just I want to thank you, Jamilia and Rebecca. Um, this has been a really wonderful conversation. Again, it's the first of a three part series and we'll be having Rebecca back on again um, with Dr. Monique Morris um, at, 
at our third part of that series. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, to stay connected with us, we invite you to join SHOT's National Opportunity to Learn Network on our website at shotfoundation.org and to also follow us on Twitter at SHOT Found uh, to, con to, excuse me, to continue the conversation. Uh, and then please join us again on March 28th for our next webinar, which will be to hear um, a funder and uh, friend briefing, which is led by Communities for Just Schools Fund, uh, to hear from a number of organizations who are reimagining school safety and discipline in schools where all young people can thrive. Um, we'll also have a webinar on March 27th at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, um, which is a challenge to philanthropy uh, to expand opportunities for Native youth. And so we want to stay the course on in all of those places. And once again, thank you, Jamelia. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.